right now on Morning News Now. Parts of Morocco reduced to rubble in the wake of that massive deadly earthquake. This morning, rescuers are racing against time as the search for survivors enters a fifth day. Overnight, officials confirmed the death toll has risen again. Many of the victims buried underneath what was once their home. Now survivors are sleeping on the street and pleading for help. We'll take you to one of the hardest hit areas. Armed and dangerous, new developments overnight in the search for that convicted killer who escaped a Pennsylvania prison nearly two weeks ago. This morning, officials say they believe he is now armed as tens of thousands of people are being warned to stay indoors after yet another sighting, this time outside the search perimeter. Unfortunately, we don't have a containment area right now, so that's another, uh, you know, another concern and another challenge. We'll bring you the latest, including what authorities are saying about his altered appearance and who he tried to contact for help. Plus, one more shot. This morning, a new COVID booster is in the works after the FDA approved an updated version of the shot to combat a spike in cases and hospitalizations. What you need to know to keep your family healthy as cold and flu season begins. And Apple checking in on your mental health with its newest operating system update. We'll break down the new feature meant to help track your well-being. Plus, we'll show you Apple's latest devices set to be unveiled later today. What will it be? Phones, tablets, AirPods? It's going to be a phone, <laughs> and I'll walk you to the Apple store, and we'll do it together. To get something that's not an Apple 7? All right. Good morning. Good to have you with us on this Tuesday. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin with the latest from Morocco, where the death toll from that catastrophic earthquake has now jumped to more than 2,800. A government official says most of the dead were buried under the rubble of collapsed buildings. In some cases, the devastation is so bad, several communities have been wiped off the map, like this village south of Marrakesh, where 90 people were killed in a town with only 100 homes. Rescue operations are taking place around the clock with search teams from Britain, Spain and Qatar assisting the Moroccan military. But hopes of finding survivors are fading. Still, there have been glimmers of hope. This video shows a rescue yesterday. Survivors were pulled from the rubble three days after the earthquake hit. This is we're getting an up close look at the moment the earthquake hit. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez has the latest. Hey there, we are now in the fourth day of this massive search and rescue operation that is stretching across a disaster zone throughout the high Atlas Mountains. Locals here tell us that in the house behind me, four people were killed when that 6.8 magnitude quake struck on Friday night. They are part of a national death toll that is now above 2,800 and climbing. And if you are a member of a family that is missing a loved one, you are praying that there are still more rescue to be done, but time is running out. Every passing hour means that hope is fading. We spoke to an international rescue team earlier who sent their search dogs home because they believe at this point it is unlikely they are going to find anyone else alive. Now, some in some of the more remote mountain villages, help has been painfully slow in arriving. We're hearing from people who say that they have been digging with their bare hands through the remains of their homes, trying trying to find family members with no sign of the government. Soldiers, uh, agents from the Ministry of the Interior are starting to reach some of those harder to reach villages now, but it has been a long time waiting. We met a community who are building tents out of wood, tarp, anything they can find just to put shelter over their children's heads. Meanwhile, there are questions about whether the Moroccan government should be doing more to accept international aid. There is right now a small American survey team on the ground, but there hasn't yet been a deal for a larger deployment of American help. Back to you. All right, Raf Sanchez, thank you. Well, an American trapped for more than a week deep inside a cave in Turkey has been rescued. In this incredible video we're going to show you, you can see American researcher Mark Dickey being lifted out of the cave on a stretcher. You may remember he was stuck inside the cave after he suffered gastrointestinal bleeding, so crews had to mount a very complex and delicate rescue operation. The Turkish Caving Federation says Dickey is doing well and being treated at a medical facility. 
North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has arrived in Russia for a closely watched meeting with President Putin. Kim crossed over into Russia overnight by train after setting off on Sunday. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey-Frayer joined us now from the South Korean capital of Seoul. Janice, good morning. So let's talk about the details we've learned about this journey. Do we know who traveled with Kim Jong-un and where and when he's going to meet with Putin? Well, it was confirmed that Kim Jong-un traveled by armored train uh, that crossed the border into Russia earlier today. There were also reports of a flight that had taken off from Pyongyang and landing in Vladivostok. And it was believed that some of Kim's senior officials were on board to join him uh, for this visit to Russia. Where and when he's going to meet with Vladimir Putin is still not clear. Uh, Putin spoke earlier today at an economic forum in Vladivostok. He said that he was planning to go uh, to a nearby high security facility in the Far East region. When he was asked by Russian media if that's where he was going to meet Kim, he said, you'll know when I get there. Uh, all Russian officials have said so far is that this is a full visit uh, for North Korea to Russia, that they are looking to boost ties with each other, and that the two men will meet, quote, in the coming days. So, Janice, we understand Russia is looking to beef up its munition stocks. Tell us a little more about what really both sides may look to get out of this meeting. Well, Joe, they're friends in need. Uh, both are widely regarded as being rogue states. Uh, both present a concern to the United States. Russia is looking for suppliers in order to restock its military supplies. And for North Korea, a weapons deal uh, could be a political and economic lifeline. North Korea has a huge defense industry uh, with very large scale production capabilities. Uh, what they may get in return uh, is to have Russia share satellite and nuclear submarine technology, which, of course, would present concerns uh, to, to U.S. allies in this region. And Janice, how is the U.S. reacting to this meeting? Well, the U.S. officials have said that they have intelligence uh, suggesting that weapons talks are at an advanced stage. Uh, between Russia and North Korea. They have warned North Korea that this would be a huge mistake and that ultimately they would, quote, pay a price. Here is more on what U.S. officials had to say today. We're going to monitor very closely the outcome of this meeting. Uh, I will remind both countries that any uh, transfer of arms from North Korea to Russia would be in violation of multiple United Nations Security Council resolutions. Uh, and we, of course, have aggressively enforced our sanctions against uh, entities that fund Russia's war effort. And we will continue to enforce those sanctions and will not hesitate to impose new sanctions if appropriate. The Pentagon has made a similar assessment in that uh, with so few details, they're going to monitor the situation. Uh, but certainly uh, going on the intelligence that the White House has reported on so far, uh, it would suggest that there are strengthening ties between uh, North Korea and Russia and could ultimately see uh, bilateral trade uh, boost in a way that uh, would be uncomfortable uh, to the United States and others. Joe. All right, Janice Mackey Freyer, keeping an eye on this meeting from Seoul. Thank you so much. And now to Pennsylvania and some major developments this morning in the manhunt for that escaped prisoner. Police say they are now pursuing the escaped inmate in a specific area after he was spotted once again last night. They are also warning that they believe he is armed with a weapon. MSNBC anchor Lindsay Reiser is following all this for us and joins us now with the latest. Hey, Lindsay, good morning. So, I mean, obviously that's a big headline, especially for people in the area believing that he's armed with a weapon. How do they know that? How do they think they got it? And, and where do they think he is now? Yeah, this really marks a heightened phase here in the search, Savannah. Good morning. We're in an area south of Coventry Township. And I can tell you that even just getting to this location here where we have a command post took many roadblocks that we had to go through. And it appears that there is a new perimeter. Now, as far as how big that perimeter is, we don't know. But this is a really dense, heavily wooded area, a lot of cornfields, a lot of cow and horse pastures, a lot of barns and nooks and crannies where Danilo Cavalcante could be. Now, you mentioned 
mentioned. He is armed. That is what we're hearing from Pennsylvania State Police. There are reports that he stole a weapon, that there was a, even a firefight overnight with a, a resident here. NBC News has not confirmed that. There are also reports that he ditched the clothing that he was last seen in, that yellow or green hoodie that he was seen in in those uh, uh, doorbell cameras. Uh, we also have not confirmed that, but we do know that there is really a heightened sense of alarm this morning. Schools in the nearby area are closed. Residents, Savannah, are being told to lock their homes and their cars. Do not approach him if they see him. And of course, call 911, Savannah. And Lindsay, police are, obviously this has been a difficult challenge for them. The suspect slipped through the perimeter over the weekend, which was a surprise to them. They say they have now changed their strategy and how they are trying to track him down. What is it exactly that we're doing? And, and do we know how it got to this point where they are not even able to kind of cool. keep him contained? I mean, yesterday they said they were switching to a containment model. And so let's go ahead and listen from state police and hear what we heard yesterday afternoon. This investigation has taken a change in direction in terms of the allocation of resources and daily focus of investigators. We have moved from a containment model to one which involves utilizing a variety of investigative resources and which has proven successful for us in the past. So we do have video of an overnight search in East Nantmeal Township, and that was where this dairy truck was found. It had run out of gas. This was a truck that Cavalcante had stolen over the weekend. And so when we ask how we got here, we know that August 31st is when this, this search happened. He crab walked up the walls of the prison, went through fences, razor wire. Um, he was in that perimeter savanna that you mentioned. That was a botanical garden, an area of around 1,000 acres. That is what he was able to slip through. And then he stole that dairy truck, uh, according to police, and he visited the homes of a couple of previous co-workers. That is where we have that doorbell camera video where he's clean shaven. He's in a different outfit, different appearance. And um, and he had interacted with at least one of those residents in his native language of Portuguese. And that person called police. And then um, again, they, they moved to that containment model because they had an idea of where he was. Not an exact perimeter, though. It appears this morning, Savannah, though, um, because of the roadblocks, because of the increased police presence we're seeing in this area where we are, which is about 50 miles away from that um, East Nantmeal Township that, that things may have pivoted, Savannah. And Lindsay, finally, before I let you go, we do also have this detail that immigration officials have detained the fugitive sister. What do we know about that? Why is that? So we know that she's facing deportation. Police say that she was an overstay and is basically facing the same process that anybody else would. Now, there, there were reports that it wasn't clear whether she had assisted her brother. Yesterday, state police said they don't believe that she did provide assistance, but they also said she's not cooperating with law enforcement, so there wasn't a law enforcement necessity to keep her. Savannah. All right, Lindsay Reiser, thank you so much. Lawyers for former President Donald Trump have filed motions to dismiss charges against him in the Georgia election case. The court filings are the first time the former president has formally moved to dismiss charges in the sprawling indictment handed up in Fulton County last month. Trump faces 13 criminal counts in Georgia. He and his 18 co-defendants have all pleaded not guilty. Well, the FDA has given the green light to updated COVID vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer. This new round of boosters is meant to protect against the latest Omicron subvariant. This approval comes as the nation is seeing an uptick in COVID cases, not to mention we are heading into cold and flu season. Mm -hmm. NBC News medical reporter Erica Edwards joins us now with more on this. So, Erica, let's talk about how well these boosters work. We know they're not magic. They actually had to start working on them earlier this year. So how effective do we think they could be against what we're seeing right now with this? Yeah, if only cases? they were magic, right? <laughs> I, so far, the data show that they work pretty well against these Omicron subvariants that are circulating. Uh, now, as far as the recent uptick in cases, it's important to remember that the vaccines are not designed to prevent you from becoming infected. They're designed to help keep people out of the hospital to prevent mm -hmm. some of those severe complications. And that's why you're likely to see a push toward getting these shots to the elderly and to people with weakened immune systems, those who are most vulnerable. The other issue here is that the vaccines are only going to work if people get them. The last time a booster came out, only 17% of those eligible actually got the shot. Yeah, I think people start to get confused what the rules are now. Do I get it every year? Do I get it with my flu shot? Um, when is this going to be available? And is there any cost associated with them? So we'll start with the cost. This is the first time that the federal government is not paying for these mm -hmm. shots. Um, both Pfizer and Moderna have said that the shots are likely to be more than $100 per shot. However, if you have private health insurance, if you have Medicare, those shots will be covered. You won't have any fee. Um, if you don't have health insurance, community health centers will also be handing them out for free. Now, as far as 
is when. Today, an advisory committee to the CDC is meeting to determine who should get the shots. Uh, mm. After that, the CDC director, Dr. Mandy Cohen, is expected to sign off on those later today. Those shots could start rolling out in the coming days. So, mm. assuming that's what happens, when should you get the shot? We know, like, conventional wisdom is like the flu shot you should get right. like, by Halloween, right? Is there any sort of advice or strategy as to when you should try and get this booster? You've done your homework. That's exactly <laughs> right. Most doctors do recommend getting both the COVID shot and the flu shot before the end of October. There was one caveat. If you've had COVID recently, the CDC might recommend waiting at least two months before you get that booster. Hmm. And what about any side effects with this one? Yeah, they're supposed to mirror previous versions of the, the COVID shot. Uh, you might have a sore arm, fatigue, nausea, headache, even fever in some cases. I think some people have learned by now whether they're someone who should take the day off the next day because maybe yeah. they have more of a reaction to the shot. It seems to be different for everyone, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. I, I do think I remember I was a little sick, but not too bad yeah. after, you know? All right. All right. Erica, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now let's get to weather. Parts of the Northeast are recovering this morning after strong storms moved through yesterday. This is what it looked like last night in Lemonster, Massachusetts. The heavy rain also washed away some roads and flooded businesses and homes. A similar scene in Rhode Island, too, where cars were submerged in floodwaters from that heavy rainfall. So let's get more on all this from meteorologist Angie Lastman. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. Unfortunately, we've got more rain on the way for that same region. We've seen a lot of it start to taper off early this morning, but we've got another big batch that's working its way to the east thanks to a cold front that is slowly but surely moving across the eastern parts of the country. Right now, that front is draped from basically the Midwest all the way down to the south. We have the rain stretching uh, along and ahead of it, and you can see places like Dallas to Memphis, St. Louis, Buffalo going to start seeing some of this rain working in. But let's focus on fo folks in the northeast because, yes, we did see ample amounts of rain, significant rainfall yesterday across parts of this region. And we've got another two days where we'll see those rainfall rates uh, pretty impressive and the rainfall uh, potential elevated, at least for your day today and tomorrow. The good news is we're not looking at some really strong storms with this. The low and severe is what we'll have a potential for, but the high uh, amounts of rainfall will be there. This is a look into your Wednesday. You can see that front finally starts to work a little closer to the coast, and then we'll see it push out and uh, eventually we'll get some nice conditions on the back side of this but between now and the middle of the week tomorrow we'll see anywhere from maybe an inch to two inches of rain but per hour we could see impressive rainfall rates too one to two inches in just an hour could lead to some potential for some flooding concerns so that's what we'll watch across parts of the northeast down through the mid-atlantic for today and into tomorrow and of course we're keeping a close eye on hurricane lee right now category three it did see a little bit of a bump up in intensity with those winds of 115 miles per hour it's a slow mover it's only moving northwest at seven miles per hour. That northerly turn that everybody has been just waiting for is eventually going to come probably in the next 24 hours. You can see the track takes it just to the west of Bermuda as we get into your early parts of Friday. We will expect this to stay well off the east coast of the United States for the most part. You'll notice that extreme northern portions and eastern portions of New England are still included in that cone as we get down the line. By Sunday, 3 a.m., we're looking at a much weaker system as it works a little farther to the north over the coming days, but that does mean that it starts to expand its wind field. We'll likely see the potential for some gusty winds across parts of New England. We'll also note that that high surf and rip current risk will be something we'll deal with up and down the East Coast for at least the next seven days. We could see some coastal flooding, maybe some coastal erosion. That'll all be on the table for us here as we get through at least the next week or so. But looking at the more specific rainfall amounts, by we the time we get to Saturday into Sunday, you can see portions of Maine could see some heavy rain working in. Uh, the the chances for that center of the storm working on shore there, of course, still in play, but we're not looking at uh, direct impacts south of this. This is going to be something we'll, of course, have to keep an eye on, guys. Uh, we've still got plenty of time. Again, the timing for this would be Friday into Saturday, so something to watch in the coming days. All right. A little bit of a rainy weekend. Yeah. Andrew, thank you. The umbrella has been getting plenty of practice <laughs> yeah. this week. Right after an off-season full of potential Super Bowl hopes, the New York Jets are now facing the possibility of a season without their new star quarterback, Aaron Rodgers. Just four plays, four snaps into his first game for the Jets last night. Rodgers suffered an apparent leg injury. And this morning, there are fears it could be season-ending. Overnight, the team's head coach said it looks like the four-time MVP may have severely injured his Achilles, which could not only threaten the 39-year-old season, but also the remainder of his career. Despite the injury, the Jets did manage to pull off an overtime win against the Buffalo Bills last night when undrafted rookie Xavier Gibson returned a punt 
65 yards for a touchdown. You can feel the pain in New York this morning yeah. <laughs> after that you, happened. Yeah. That was an expensive we'll, exactly. <laughs> call. We'll and, yeah. We'll get Ooh. more news later today and see what happens. Much more to come here on Morning News Now. Later this hour, Tech Talk. Some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley are heading to Capitol Hill. What we know about a closed-door meeting on artificial intelligence. Up first, though, after the break, nearly 200,000 migrants missing in America. The new watchdog report shedding light on the country's growing migrant crisis. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The Department of Homeland Security is under fire after an internal watchdog found the agency lost track of 177,000 migrants inside the U.S. in a 17-month period and also discovered that once migrants are released in the U.S., to await those asylum hearings, DHS really only has a limited ability to track them. For more, we're joined by NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley. Hey, Julia, good to see you. So walk us through this report exactly. Help us understand how it is that the agency lost track of, really, frankly, so many people. Yeah, it's interesting. It actually dovetails with a lot of what we've been reporting. As the Biden administration had more migrants coming across, they started to release people not only not in detention, but without what they would call alternatives to detention, where you can track someone through a phone check-in, a mobile app, even an ankle monitor. They were releasing more people in the address field that a migrant would typically put on their form. In over 177,000 cases, that form was either missing or it wasn't a real address. They found many people. Sometimes they'd have 50 people using the same address, and it would turn out to be a restaurant in Michigan or a church in Illinois. These weren't real places. I think possibly smugglers were giving migrants these addresses to put down. And also, the damage it does not only to Homeland Security, but also to migrants who might not have a real address to put down or whoever was taking their information didn't get it correctly, that means that migrant doesn't get information about their court hearing, where they can go next, if the date changed, and that could put them at a real problem if they're trying to claim asylum within the year of their entrance. So it's a problem for both sides, DHS and migrants, if they don't get that information accurately. So what is being done to address this issue? And is anything also being done to try to find those missing migrants, those nearly 200,000 people? Well, DHS says that, look, it's really the burden is on the migrant to give that information when they cross. A lot of people are crossing with no documents or fraudulent documents. It's hard for them to determine exactly where in the United States they're going to go. Oftentimes, the majority of cases, they'll give the address of a family member they might be staying with. But it's really not up to DHS to determine exactly where they are going. They're kind of taking them where they say they will go because it's in their best interest to be tracked if they want to win that ability to stay here legally. So they are are hampered, although the IG did say DHS needs to do a better job of getting this information and having ICE and CBP talk to each other so that they have that same information across both agencies. And Julia, what are we hearing from DHS about this report? How are they responding? <laughs> Well, DHS says, look, we are operating in a broken immigration system and the burden really falls to the migrant. That's why they did not concur with those recommendations from the Department of Homeland Security, I mean, from the IG. Uh, but they say that, look, they, are, they do take steps to try to get as accurate as information as possible. And they're pushing back pretty strongly on some of these uh, allegations in the report, although they have not pushed back on the fact that over 177,000, and that was just in a 17-month period, uh, had addressed that, that really didn't turn out to be legitimate. Absolutely. All right, Julia Ainsley, thank you so much. A Los Angeles area plastic surgeon known as Dr. Laguna is facing some troubling allegations. The Orange County District Attorney filed a civil lawsuit saying the surgeon allegedly touched patients without their consent and posted photos and videos of them online. This comes after more than 30 women accused him in a separate case of battery and medical malpractice. NBC News correspondent Liz Kreutz has more. This is Dr. Laguna. He calls himself Dr. Laguna. Allow your butt to be smaller, tidier, more athletic. Dr. Arian Malavi regularly posts videos like this on social media. We fine tune and hone in on the butt of your dreams. But it's not all a dream for the popular Southern California plastic surgeon. The Orange County District Attorney has filed a civil lawsuit against Malavi, alleging 19 unlawful business practices, including touching potential patients 
and patients without their consent and publishing photos and videos of clients on websites without their consent. To like smack in like her bottom to like make it like be wiggly. Harmony Williams is a former employee who spoke to our Los Angeles local station KNBC and says she told some patients what she saw in the OR. These people can't protect themselves when they're asleep. These claims against Malavi come after more than 30 former patients are also suing him in a separate case for allegations including battery and medical malpractice. So he grabs me about two inches above my vagina while I'm naked and grabs me right underneath my breast from behind me. This is how it's going to look. For me, it felt very aggressive. It was combative. It was degrading. It was combative. It was yeah. aggressive. It was humiliating. Malavi denies the claims and is suing former patient Shalene Johnson for defamation. My results are horrific, and it was one of the most traumatic experiences of my life. It's definitely one of the biggest mistakes of my life. That lawsuit is now on hold because Malavi has declared bankruptcy. It all comes after late last year, the Medical Board of California suspended Malavi's license for 90 days following an investigation into the death of one of his patients in 2018. According to the lawsuit by the Orange County DA, that investigation stemmed from Malavi's unlicensed medical staff performing medical procedures on a patient. Johnson says that's information she wished she had known. I would have never gone to this doctor. Never. Our thanks to Liz Kreutz for that report. NBC has reached out to Dr. Malavi's attorney for comment. We have not yet heard back. His 90-day suspension by the medical board is over. That means right now he is able to work. There are new details in the investigation into allegations of sexual harassment involving Michigan State University's head football coach. Mel Tucker says the allegations against him are false, but that did not stop the university from suspending him without pay while this investigation plays out. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has the latest, and we do want to warn you, some of the details may be difficult to hear. One of the highest paid coaches in college football sidelined amid an off-the-field scandal. I have suspended Mel Tucker without pay. Calling it an interim measure, Michigan State University Sunday suspending head coach Mel Tucker over an allegation he sexually harassed victim's advocate Brenda Tracy. Her claim dates back to April of last year after she spoke to the team about preventing sexual violence. According to a USA Today investigation citing her Title IX complaint, she claimed she was later on the phone with the coach when he made sexual comments about her and masturbated. In a statement, Tucker said Tracy's allegations of harassment are completely false, characterizing the phone call as a mutual private event between two adults living at opposite ends of the country. NBC News has not independently reviewed the complaint. So this morning's news might sound like the MSU of old. It was not. Michigan State leaders said new developments prompted them to suspend Tucker less than two years into his $95 million contract. We are focused on prevention work with men. Tracy lectures collegiate athletes nationwide on preventing sexual violence after her own brutal assault in Oregon in the 90s, allegedly by multiple college football players. About her encounter with Coach Tucker telling USA Today, the idea that someone could know me and say they understand my trauma, but then re-inflict that trauma on me is so disgusting to me. Students here on campus are frustrated by this news. It comes just five years after that half a billion dollar settlement with victims of gymnastics doctor Larry Nasser. MSU leaders say a formal hearing on this matter is set for next month. Back to you. All right, Maggie Vespa, thank you so much. Well, coming up over the counter and ineffective, up next, the new evidence that has some doctors raising questions about a common ingredient in popular cold meds. And researchers say they've discovered a link between depression and diabetes. We'll have your weekly mental health check-in after the break. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. As we head into cold season, there are questions about the effectiveness of an ingredient found in many over-the-counter medicines. NBC News correspondent Ann Thompson takes a closer look. Well, it may be time to take a look in your medicine cabinet and read the labels because a very common ingredient in cold and sinus medicine may not work at all. It is a key ingredient in many popular over-the-counter medicines like Sudafed PE, Dayquil and NyQuil Severe phenylephrine, or PE. But a growing body of evidence claims PE doesn't work as a decongestant when taken orally, in a pill or liquid. Dr. Pervy Parikh is a New York City allergist. Do you recommend oral PE? 
No, actually, especially because recent studies have shown um, that's not very effective at all. An FDA advisory committee will have its say, evaluating evidence, including from the agency's scientists, that say while safe, orally administered PE is not effective as a nasal decongestant. It didn't clear Betsy Yates's head. Just wasn't working and I was miserable. If the FDA pulls the generally recommended safe and effective designation from oral PE, you're going to have to turn to your pharmacist for medicines available without a prescription, but that are kept behind the counter. That medicine contains pseudoephedrine. That's what Betsy used. You could tell a difference between this, the Sudafed that you get from behind the counter versus what's just available um, on the shelf. The OTC manufacturers group says oral PE should stay, arguing taking the drug away could cause people to delay or forego treatment. Dr. Parikh says there are better options. They should switch to those 24-hour oral antihistamines, those nasal steroids or um, nasal antihistamine sprays. Now, there are side effects to oral PE. They include sleeplessness, headaches, and nervousness. But the issue before the FDA panel is effectiveness, and we could get an answer very soon. Now back to you. All right, Ann, thank you so much. Now from the body to the mind, it's time for our weekly check-in. Apple is expanding its health app to include mental health as part of the service. That's right, and there's new research out there that suggests going for a swim could improve your outlook. Dr. Somia Dave is a psychiatrist and author of What a Happy Family. She joins us now with more on these stories. Hi, doctor, always great to have you on. So let's start with a new study that suggests a link between depression and type 2 diabetes. What can you tell us about this? What do people need to know? So previous research has shown that people with type 2 diabetes are two times more likely to be diagnosed with depression, but for a long time, the why behind that was unclear. Was it type 2 diabetes causing depression? Was it depression causing type 2 diabetes? And this recent study that was published in Diabetes Care Journal found seven genetic variants that contribute to both conditions. The shared genes played roles in inflammation and in the regulation of insulin, which is one of the hormones that regulates blood sugar. Now, we know that mental health and physical health are connected, and now we have even more insight into this particular relationship. And so I encourage anyone who is curious or concerned to talk to their primary care provider, know your risk factors, and see if there's a prevention or treatment plan that can be suitable and supportive for you. All right, so later today, Apple has its big event unveiling whatever new devices we're going to get. Apple's yeah. also expanding its health app to include mental health, so users will be oh. prompted to answer questions about how they feel. The app will make suggestions based on their response. At the same time, people might have some questions. Apple mm -hmm. is not a, a person who's trained in this, or so doctor, what do you think yeah. about all this? We're in such an interesting time, right, where technology and mental health are continuing to intersect. And Apple's platform, State of Mind, is going to include screening questionnaires for symptoms of depression and anxiety. As you said, ways to track your mood, your general well-being. I view these as potential supplements, not substitutes, meaning that it can be really helpful to have information about how we're doing. And it's also not a replacement for seeing a qualified mental health provider. In fact, these can be points of information to bring into an appointment with a qualified mental health provider. Mental health is complicated. It's made up of many different things. That also includes our abilities to prioritize sleep, socialize, have movement, so many different things. And so I think it's important to remember that this might be different for each person and that people also need more support. And so we're going to see very interesting things coming forward with this. Absolutely. Finally, there are some new studies out. I've actually seen a lot of this online, too, that swimming in open water can help physically and mental health. What do you think about this? Is this real? What are these benefits people are seeing? Well, what a timely topic for where we're at in the year, right? So yes, swimming, open water swimming can have a lot of benefits. A review in the Journal of Environmental Psychology found that it can boost mood and it can also decrease feelings of anger, tension, and stress. So all great things. People who also participate in open water swimming tend to do it for long periods of time and also with other people. So a great opportunity for connection and for socialization. Now, water can be therapeutic and soothing in many forms. So so if this isn't an option for someone, even listening to the sounds of water, looking at a body of water, taking a warm shower or a bath or having a cup of tea can also provide some of these soothing benefits as well. So just things to keep in mind as we ease into fall. I, I totally buy this because I've had twice this summer where I've been like on a little coastal trip mm -hmm. in the ocean and you go in the ocean and it's so calm, especially yeah. when the waves are hitting you. 
I think it's great. I find yeah, there's like something to it. I agree. Here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Different, different <laughs> perspectives in the on ocean, the open I love water. It, but yeah, or maybe like a lake, you know, where yeah, okay, I, I get it too. We'll, we'll and and lake, shower, right. bath, all that kind of stuff. Dr. Dave, thank you so much. Great to see you. <laughs> Coming up, Google and the government going head to head in court. After the break, we'll tell you about the major antitrust trial that could change the way you surf the web. You're watching Morning News now. The government is taking on Google today in what's expected to be the biggest antitrust trial in decades. Here's the issue before the court. Is the reach of Google's popular search engine too powerful? The government says yes, Google says no. NBC's Jake Ward has more on that case that could dramatically reshape the tech landscape. When you go to search the web from almost any phone, Google is your default way of doing it. But that's no coincidence. Google pays Apple and others to make sure that's the case. Now, a suit from the Department of Justice and a coalition of 39 states asks, do those deals keep competitors out of the market and give Google illegal dominance in the process? Essentially, every smartphone that people get has Google as the default search, and it's baked into everything. And that means we don't have a competitive advertising market. Google has about 88% of the domestic search market and over 70% of the market for the ads you see when you search, which is most of how the company makes money. But the company argues that using Google isn't mandatory and that Apple and others chose to charge for the default placement, a perfectly legal arrangement. We think there are a lot of different ways people are choosing to get information these days. And on the choice side, it's never been easier for people at home to be able to choose a different web search. United States versus Google is in many ways United States versus big tech, a test of whether the government has legal authority to rein in corporations that wield historic power over how we access information. The government is hoping to do better than the Federal Trade Commission has. The case goes to trial after a string of recent court losses for the FTC, which has unsuccessfully tried to stop acquisitions by companies like Microsoft and Meta. But an anti-monopoly nonprofit says these are the right battles to fight. It's a very intentional effort has been made for the past 50 years to chip away at the federal antitrust laws and to make them harder to enforce. And right now, the monopolies of our time are increasingly in big tech. Google faces more than just this case. An antitrust suit filed in January accuses it of also being a monopoly as it sells the technology that powers the way online ads are placed across the web. And that's its second largest source of revenue. Google says the market is wide open there, too. But Google's biggest worry at the moment is presumably not this case. It is instead the rise of AI-powered chatbots like ChatGPT, which threatened to replace the classic search engine that made Google one of history's richest institutions. Its business model under attack in the market, even as it must also defend it in court. Our thanks to Jake Ward for that report. Well, the trial is expected to stretch over 10 weeks, with a ruling likely coming early next year. More financial news now. The United Auto Workers Union is making some changes to its demands in that ongoing labor dispute. CNBC's Silvana Hanau is with us this morning with that and other money news. Hey, Silvana. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning to you. Yeah, so the United Auto Workers is slightly lowering its demand for a pay increase to 36% from 40%. Sources say the union is asking for a series of wage hikes over the next five years, starting with a boost of 18 percent. Raises would then alternate between 4 and 5 percent annually over the life of the contract. Reports say the big three automakers believe the union's demand could threaten their viability. GM, Ford and Chrysler parent Stellantis face a deadline of midnight on Friday to reach a new contract. The UAW's president has threatened to strike all three companies simultaneously. Fast food workers in California are set to get a minimum wage of $20 an hour. Labor unions and the restaurant industry reaching a deal yesterday, potentially killing a referendum slated to be on the ballot in 2024. Under the agreement, workers at chains with at least 60 locations nationwide must be paid $20 an hour by April. California's minimum wage is set to rise to $16 an hour in January. McDonald's is getting rid of self-serve soda machines. The transition will be completed by 2032, and at that point, customers will have to ask for refills at the counter. McDonald's isn't saying whether it was financial or health reasons that led to the decision. The USA Today reports several franchises in Illinois have already made the shift, citing food safety theft and a lack of dine-in customers, guys. So will the person behind the counter, like, understand when I go, okay, I want half Coke Zero, yeah. then half 
orange. You know what, Joe? Like, you can ask him in 2032. <laughs> yeah, exa like, exactly. Thanks, Savannah. To figure it out. All right, Savannah, thanks so Thank much. Thank you. You got it. This week, some of the biggest names in tech are descending on Capitol Hill for a series of hearings on artificial intelligence. Yeah, the most highly anticipated gathering is expected to be during tomorrow's closed-door meeting between senators and high-profile tech executives. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale joins us now for more on this. Hi, Ali. Great to see you. So, first off, just explain to us the purpose of all these hearings. Why is Congress focusing on artificial intelligence? We obviously know how important this is to all of our lives, but tell us exactly what it is that's happening on the Hill. Well, look, we know how important this is to all of our lives, but also how fast moving it is. And that's the goal on the part of Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is to try to get in front of this from a legislative perspective, inform his members, get them as much information on AI and tech in this space as they possibly can get, and then see what kind of legislation it can lead. It's not the way that things usually go up here, and I'll get to why that could be problematic in a moment, but this is really an attempt by Schumer and others to try to get ahead of the curve in the ways that they think that they struggled around things like social media. You'll remember, we've seen a lot of legislating and conversation around TikTok, around Instagram, social media, all of that over the last few years. A lot of lawmakers feel like they're behind the curve. They're trying to avoid that by doing this now on mm. AI. So let's talk about what we can expect from tomorrow's private event with those big tech execs. Do we know who's attending and why is it closed door? Yeah. Yeah, look, this is going to be a who's who. And yes, I am very very concerned about if there's going to be the cage match or not between Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> because they are going to be the big names that are in this room. We've asked some of the lawmakers. They've made some jokes about it. Certainly we're going to follow up on Wednesday. I think the other key piece of this, though, is you're going to see Sam Altman, of course, one of the heads of ChatGPT. All of these are going to be key names that are in the room answering questions from lawmakers, but it is closed door. And I have spoken to lawmakers, specifically Senator Elizabeth Warren, who is in Schumer's leadership structure, saying that these law that these folks shouldn't have the opportunity to come to the Hill behind closed doors and effectively lobby to continue making money the way that they have been making money. Instead, what Warren says, and other senators have echoed this, is that this should go through a more regular order, which is to say public hearings from these folks who are coming before Congress and answering questions from lawmakers in a public fashion. When they're in the room on Wednesday, only a few select moderators, a few select lawmakers are going to be able to ask mm. them questions. For people like Warren, she says, okay, I'm going to come in the beginning, I'll hear their pitch, but then she doesn't really see a reason to be in the room. And there are other senators, Senator John Thune on the Republican side of this, who have echoed that process. Why not just do this the way that we do things normally? Put it through a public hearing process and then start legislating around it. And so, Ali, first of all, why is it that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is taking the lead on all this? But then also, as you just kind of touched on there, could we see AI legislation brought to the floor anytime soon? I mean, it's, I think, just a difficult thing for all of us to get our arms around. So to actually be able to figure out how to put legislation on paper and get it in front of anybody and pass right. is a whole other story. Is that going to happen soon? I think we're even less talking right now about the can it pass piece and the what would that legislation even look like piece. There are a few spots of legislation that are already floating around from bipartisan groups of senators on this. This doesn't have the deep partisanship that we often see on a lot of issues. It's why tech has been a space where we've been able to see some bipartisan odd couples move forward with legislation. We're not even there yet, though, because the legislation hasn't even been been written, so to speak. They're still in the information gathering phase. I do think the Schumer question is also a good one. This is a guy who still notoriously uses a flip phone. Why is he going to be one of the leading voices on legislating around AI? That's definitely a question we have on the Hill. But look, shoot for Schumer as a majority leader. This is really a moment for potential legacy building for him. The way that he's doing this also sort of speaks to that. He could do this the way that other senators were saying, the w regular way of doing it. Instead, he's convening this in a much more public what way. We've seen forums. Now, of course, we'll see the big names come to Capitol Hill. Just because they're behind closed doors now, I think all of us and other senators might want to see them in mm -hmm. front of cameras and in front of Congress in a public fashion, too. That's not ruled out. This is just how we're starting. Huh. And if there is a cage match, I wonder if Majority Leader Schumer would be the referee there. Oh, I will be. <laughs> oh, yeah. We will bust down I'll those closed doors. Right. He will open up those closed doors. We'll I'll be the referee that. I'm ready. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank it. You. Coming up, Apple enthusiasts, today's your day. That's right. We're about to get our first look at some of Apple's newest devices. More on what to expect from today's big unveiling next on Morning News Now.
Welcome back. Looks like LeBron James wants a third Olympic gold medal. The Athletic is reporting that James is ready to head to next summer's Paris Games and is recruiting other top basketball stars to join him. According to the report, he has spoken to Steph Curry, Kevin Durant, Anthony Davis, Jason Tatum, and Draymond Green, who are all prepared to join him. James is already a three-time Olympian and two-time gold medalist. Team USA only managed fourth place at the FIBA World Cup over the weekend, so all that star power could help them get back on top. Maybe we'll have another dream team. The anticipation's building, and now the wait is over. Apple's big annual event is happening today at the company's headquarters in California, where it is set to unveil the latest devices. Dalvin Brown joins us now on set. He's a consumer tech reporter for The Wall Street Journal. So first up, we always think about fall uh, phones. We assume they're going to unveil what it would be, iPhone 15 we're at right now. What do we know about that? Any idea how much it would cost? Yeah, so we expect Apple to unveil a handful of devices, but the iPhones will be the most uh, attentive grabbing. So we're expecting four new iPhones, two entry-level iPhones as well as two pro model iPhones. Um, on the, but the thing they'll all have in common is a USB-C port, a new USB-C port. So that'll be the selling point for all these iPhones. Um, Apple is doing away with its proprietary lightning port in phones. So, uh, you know, the charger you've been using for the past 10 years, you won't be using anymore if you get that, the iPhone 15. Will they all be uniform chargers at some point? Is that what we're going toward finally? Yeah, <laughs> we're going toward a world where you can just carry around one charger oh my goodness, if you. you are an iPhone <laughs> user, yes. Um, we're also paying close attention to, to price for the model level or for the premium iPhones. So analysts are saying they may be 100 to $200 more expensive as Apple tries to keep up with inflation. Right. But uh, but yeah, the, the uh, connector, the USB-C will be the, the big sell. My little travel kit has like 15 different types of chargers, so anything to simplify that is great. Okay, let's talk about some of the other things that could be happening. You were telling me maybe new watch, new AirPods, is that right? Yeah, so we're expecting some some upgrades to the Apple Watch, maybe a new chipset for both the Apple Watch Ultra as well as the Apple Watch Series 9. Uh, and when it comes to the AirPods, we're hoping for a USB-C charger for the AirPods as well, so you can do away with that lightning cable. Um, you know, with your with your earbuds as well. Yeah, because I think my AirPods have different chargers than all my phones too. So we'll take all that. What what else are you excited about? I mean, oftentimes these things come with some sort of surprises, right? Could we see anything like that? And how do we all watch this too? Remind us. <laughs> yeah. So Apple's full of surprises. We one of the things I'm I'm hoping for and that analysts are expecting is that there may be a change to the mute uh, button on your phone. So the toggle that's been there since the beginning might be turning into a reprogrammable button that lets you, you know, launch your flashlight if you want to. Um, so that might be changing. Uh, as far as where you can watch it, we'll be tuning in. I'll be tuning in from YouTube. Uh, Apple will stream it live on its on its YouTube channel. How have these events changed over the years? It seems like they used to be a bigger deal and there were maybe more surprises is, have it, has it changed over time? Yeah, so I haven't been to any of the Apple events yeah. in person, but one of the things that I do know for sure is that consumers are holding on to their iPhones longer. So Apple is, you know, it, it's this is a really pivotal event for Apple. It needs to make sure that, like, whatever it's releasing to consumers is glitzy enough to get people to pay for perhaps what may be a more expensive phone. You mentioned people hold on to their phones longer. I'm going to show you. It's a running joke here. Uh, this, this is my phone. It has the button still. This is a 7. Love the home button. This is literally an iPhone 7. So <laughs> I may decide to finally get a new one. Yeah. <laughs> my my I, work one's more modern. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not, you, that phone's probably not supported by the latest <laughs> Apple software update, so it might be time also for Also, the plug-in, I think, is just an old-school one from like the 1990s. All right, Delvin Brown, thank you so much for helping us prepare for this big event today. We appreciate it with the Wall Street Journal. Thanks. All right, that's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stick with us, though. The news continues right now. Right now in Morning News Now, the death toll is rising in Morocco with that massive earthquake that struck near Marrakesh over the weekend. We'll bring you the latest on recovery efforts there as hopes fade of finding survivors beneath the rubble. Also this morning, a breath of fresh air for that American explorer who was trapped underground in a Turkish cave for more than a week. Now he's back above ground. We've got more on that dramatic rescue in a moment.
Plus, armed and dangerous, chilling new developments overnight in that sweeping manhunt for a convicted murderer in Pennsylvania. State police this morning zeroing in on an area just northwest of Philadelphia. They're telling the public the fugitive may have a weapon. We are on the ground with the very latest on that search. And we don't. Later in the hour, we're flipping the traditional wedding I do on its head with a closer look at bridesmaid burnout that could put a strain on that special day. Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. Yeah, thanks for being here. I'm Savannah Sellers. We begin with the latest on that devastating earthquake in Morocco. Overnight, the death toll soared to more than 2,800 people. Yeah, this morning, the desperate search for survivors continues. But four days after the deadliest earthquake to hit the country in decades, hope is growing dim. The United Nations estimates about 300,000 people in the region were impacted by the quake, with many sleeping outside amid concerns over aftershocks. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez is in Morocco with the latest. This morning, Morocco praying for more rescues like these as soldiers finally arrive in remote villages. The difficult search for survivors spread across a vast expanse of the high Atlas Mountains is now in its fourth day. And rescuers are facing a sea of rubble, professionals working alongside locals, often digging with bare hands. All across the disaster zone, search teams like this are fanning out. Some of them are moving from rescue to recovery. This team has been told there may be a body inside what remains of this house. Even specially trained dogs struggling to find survivors. Already the people alive been pulled out, and uh, but unfortunately there's still uh, corpses in the rubble. We are trying to help the families to recover. Across the mountain, newly dug graves. This father preparing to bury his young son. And on this windswept hillside, families are building makeshift shelters with whatever they can find. As with so many disasters, it's the poorest who are hardest hit. Their homes made of the most basic materials crumbling as a result of the quake. This house is literally made of loose rocks held together by a bit of concrete. <laughs> Yesterday, we met Lawson, who lost his wife and all four of his children. This is all that's left of the house where they died. Scattered in the rubble, small reminders of the family that once called this place home. Zahra and her husband are surviving on mint tea and bread. Little aid is reaching here. We're here because all the houses fell down, she says, and we have nothing. All our belongings, our money, clothes, everything was inside. This is everything you have left. Zahra unwrapping her hijab to show us an injury. You hear in the back of the head as the roof came down? A brick. And everywhere, exhausted parents watching over kids who still, somehow, are able to smile. That's Raf Sanchez reporting. Raf, thank you. For more, we're joined now by Zomi Frankum. She is the activation manager at World Central Kitchen, which has provided support for those affected by the earthquake. Zomi, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us. Obviously, I mean, getting assistance to such a devastated area presents a lot of logistical challenges. Take us through the situation on the ground, what your team's seeing. Thank you, Joe. So as you saw from previous footage, uh, World Central Kitchen is overcoming logistical uh, challenges, as you've seen, um, roads are broken, um, systems are broken, and so we have been using helicopters, we've been using high clearance four-wheel drives uh, to get our scouting teams out there with sandwiches, fruit and water. Um, we have a fleet of uh, four-wheel, uh, sorry, food trucks um, that have just come online. Um, and so we'll be getting those up to areas as well. Um, so there's really a, a lot of challenges, but we have an incredible team um, of Moroccan folks who every problem um, that comes up, um, they are giving us the answers to be able to get to really where the need is. Um, and they're really directing World Central Kitchen to be the most effective. It's good to hear you have such great organization to help you out there on the ground. I understand you're doing more than just helping with food. You're also helping with medical evacuations from some of these remote areas. Tell us about that and how big of a challenge that has been. 
Absolutely. So one of the benefits of um, being able to reach these remote communities via helicopter is that by the time we do um, serve meals, um, our fresh meals, food and water, is that there is space in helicopters to be able to repatriate those who need to get to medical attention ASAP. Um, and so it's been, it's not our core work, but it's certainly been a real blessing to be able to do that for the uh, families of Morocco. What is the biggest need on the ground right now? There's many needs on the ground at the moment. Um, obviously, as you've seen from uh, your um, man on the ground, uh, there is food, water, um, shelter as well. Um, families are looking ahead to winter time. They know that that's going to be coming, and so there is a lot of anxiety um, around that. Um, but for World Central Kitchen, um, you know, we are really making sure that we are laser focused on getting those fresh meals um, and clean water out to those communities. So, so that is one less thing that they need to worry about. Obviously, when something like this happens, people at home wonder how it is they can help. It's top of mind right now. It may not be in the headlines so much a few days from now or a couple weeks from now. What's your biggest message to people, first of all, who, who want to help right now, but also to help them realize this is something that is not just going to go away and fix itself in the next few days. This is a long-term situation that we need to focus on. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. And so... Uh... And the best to be uh, best to head to World Central Kitchen um, website wck.org, where we will be updating um, regularly. Also, our social media pages. We will put out any calls for um, for any needs if we needed volunteers or anything like that. However, um, as I mentioned, with the uh, the Moroccan community and the Moroccan people that we've been working shoulder to shoulder with, I have just as an outpouring of um, support. Um, everybody has asked us what we need. Um, and we've been able to move so effectively and so quickly um, by virtue of these communities who are our superpower. We cannot um, do what we do without them. Um, and so follow us along at wck.org um, and we'll let you know there. Zomi Frankham, thank you so much for joining us this morning and thank you for everything your organization is doing right now. Thank you, Joe. An American researcher has been rescued after spending more than a week thousands of feet underground in a cave in Turkey. Mark Dickey suffered a medical emergency in one of the deepest caves in the world, triggering a complex rescue mission that lasted several days. Late yesterday, he finally reached the surface and is now being monitored by doctors. NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea has been following this story over the last several days and has the latest on this dramatic rescue. Kelly, good morning. Joe, good morning to you. Yeah, the rescue teams really pushed through those last several hundred feet of the rescue working late into the night to finally end this ordeal for Mark Dickey. The elite cave explorer was carried to the surface 37 minutes after midnight local time. This morning, a successful end to an extraordinary rescue. Mark Dickey giving a thumbs up and a smile as he was hoisted to safety overnight. It is amazing to be above ground again. I was underground for far longer than ever expected. This morning, posting a selfie from intensive care, thanking his rescuers, saying it was a scary experience and the closest to death I've been yet. The elite cave explorer and researcher was on an international you expedition of the Morca Cave, Turkey's third deepest, when he suddenly became seriously ill with internal bleeding 3,000 feet underground. I kept throwing up blood. Um, and then my consciousness started to like get harder to hold on to, and I reached the point that I was like, I'm not going to live. The only way out, a 15-hour climb. A medical team climbed down, giving Dickey blood transfusions. And on Saturday, rescuers started the delicate climb out, with Dickey strapped to a stretcher. His body swinging on the pulley system for the final few feet to the surface. The rescuers, more than 150 from around the world, now celebrating. Seeing that he was well made me happy, and I let myself go, and I cried a little. His parents releasing an emotional statement saying the rescue is indescribably relieving and fills us with incredible joy, adding, all that has been done for our son means and will always mean so very much to us. By his side was his fiance Jessica Van Ord, who climbed nearly half a mile for help. I gotta tell you, I don't know what to say. This is this is overwhelming. <laughs> this is a this is a first. 
Um, <laughs> make it a last. How'd you make feel? it a last time, too. Thank you. Now above ground and grateful. Dickie was flown by helicopter last night to a hospital nearby in Turkey where he's in intensive care today. But as you saw, Joe, in that social media post, he's well enough today to once again thank the Turkish government and the international caving community for saving his life. Yeah, Joe. That, that giant smile in that picture he took in the hospital <laughs> speaks volumes right there. Her joy, relief, all the emotions. All right. Kelly, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Overnight, North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un arrived in Russia by train for talks with President Putin. The two leaders are expected to discuss arms deals and economic aid as Moscow attempts to beef up its munition stocks for the war in Ukraine. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel joins us now from central Ukraine. Richard, good morning. Good morning. Kim Jong-un doesn't travel abroad very often. This is only the fourth known time that he's made an international trip. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the only time he's made an international trip in the last four years. So clearly something uh, significant is motivating him. Uh, he has already crossed into Russia. He has crossed into the Far East. Uh, it is evening time there now. And he is expected to meet with Vladimir Putin as early as tomorrow possibly at a missile launch facility. North Korean state television showed Kim Jong-un waving to top government and military officials as he left Pyongyang on his bulletproof train for Russia. And he has good reason to be smiling. As the slow-moving train crossed the Russian border, Kim is finally feeling needed, courted by President Vladimir Putin. Two of the leaders America is most wary of are coming together. Putin, attending an economic forum in the eastern city of Vladivostok, is expected to greet Kim with the full honors of a state visit. A new model of mutual relations and integration is being born, but not on a basis of Western standards, Putin said. There's a more practical reason for the rare summit, too. North Korea produces artillery and missiles, which it aims at South Korea, a close U.S. ally. But since the two Koreas haven't fought a war in decades, the North has vast stockpiles of the weapons, which Putin needs now to fend off Ukraine's American-backed counteroffensive. I think the fact that Russia is ha having to beg North Korea for military support speaks to the effectiveness of our sanctions. The weapons transfer would be a violation of international sanctions. But for two states already under sanctions, that could be little deterrent. Deals are already in motion. Putin's defense minister was in Pyongyang in July to discuss an arms trade. A top Chinese Communist Party member joined the Russian defense minister at a military parade. It's unclear what Putin would give Kim in return, but it's expected to include food, and support for North Korea's advanced weapon systems. Kim just oversaw the launch of what North Korea called its first tactical nuclear attack submarine. President Putin's continued desire to push this war, to stop Ukraine's counteroffensive, is now bringing together Russia, China, and North Korea. Joe. All right, Richard, thank you so much. Iran's president says his government will decide where and how it spends the $6 billion in previously frozen funds, which is set to be released as part of a prisoner exchange agreement with the United States. The leader made the comments in an exclusive interview with NBC's Lester Holt in Iran's capital, Tehran, through a government translator. Here's part of that conversation. What is your expectation of its use? We're told that it's for humanitarian purposes, food and medicine. Do you believe you have the right to use that money in any way that you see fit? This money belongs to the Islamic Republic of Iran, and naturally, we will decide, the Islamic Republic of Iran will decide to, sp to spend it wherever uh, we need it. How to spend our money, of course, it is under the authority of the Islamic Republic of Iran. So if I hear you clearly that it will be used for more than humanitarian purposes in your view. Humanitarian means whatever the Iranian people needs. So this money will be budgeted for those needs. 
and the needs of the Iranian uh, people will be decided and determined by the Iranian government. You can see much more of Lester's interview with Iran's president tonight when he anchors NBC Nightly News from Tehran. There are major new developments this morning in the massive manhunt for that escaped prisoner in Pennsylvania. Authorities say they're pursuing him in a specific area where they believe he is, but they also warn they now believe he is armed. NBC News correspondent George Solis has the latest. This morning, we're on the edge of that new perimeter after that latest sighting of Danilo Cavalcante. This was really the worst case scenario for authorities now that Cavalcante has obtained a weapon. This morning, some schools in the area shut down as a precaution as this desperate manhunt intensifies. This morning, a new sighting of convicted killer Daniello Cavalcante, who police say now has a weapon. Overnight, state police chasing the escaped convict in South Coventry Township, Pennsylvania, where police have told residents to remain inside and lock doors and windows, saying, quote, Cavalcante is armed with a weapon. Scanner audio appearing to describe a sighting. Hispanic male, roughly 30 years of age, 5 foot, and currently shirtless and blue pants. Subjects known to have a 22 cutoff rifle with a scope and a flashlight. Authorities have not confirmed what type of weapon Cavalcante has. I know this is an extremely stressful time for the community. Cavalcante now entering its 13th day with nearly 300 officers and multiple agencies on the ground. We live in a very, very nice area where we don't lock anything. So it's it's been really crazy. After his dramatic escape from the Chester County Prison, after multiple sightings in the area, police say he has now changed his appearance. And that Cavalcante has tried to reach out to others, including a former co-worker where he was caught on camera. Police say video, not yet released, shows Cavalcante speaking Portuguese. Authorities characterizing his demeanor as urgent but friendly and someone clearly looking for help. We will ultimately capture him. He doesn't have what he needs to, to uh, last long term. Super quiet guy, really shy. Franco Rosa used to live with Cavalcante. They were roommates until Rosa says he moved out the day before Cavalcante murdered his ex-girlfriend, Deborah Brandau, unaware he was also wanted for a prior homicide in Brazil. Has he made any attempt to reach out to you? No, no nothing at all. Um, and I hope he won't do it, and if he does, I'll call the police right away. Immigration officials have detained the fugitive sister. Authorities not saying if she's helped her brother since his escape from the Chester County Prison and issuing this stern warning to anyone thinking about assisting the desperate fugitive. We will prosecute you fully for those actions. Authorities are concerned that Cavalcante may try to steal another vehicle, so they're urging the public to remain even more vigilant. Authorities also confident that Cavalcante is not only within Pennsylvania, but right here in Chester County. Back to you. All right, George, thank you. Time now for your check on weather. We're keeping a close eye on the track of Hurricane Lee. That's right. Angie Lassman is here with the details for us. Hey, Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. This is the, a situation we've been watching for what feels like an eternity, and we've still got a long way to go with Hurricane Lee as it slowly but surely moves out of uh, that northern area just north of the, of the Leeward Islands and up towards parts of the East Coast. So let's talk about the latest details that we have. Still Category 3, 575 miles south of Bermuda and moving at a snail's pace of just seven miles per hour in the northwest direction. It's eventually going to start that northerly turn here as we go through at least the next 24 hours. Note where it is compared to Bermuda. We're expecting it to be just to the west of Bermuda, the core likely escaping that island, but we're not going to see a, zero impacts for folks there. They're still going to see likely tropical storm conditions. We'll probably see tropical storm alerts put up later today, maybe into the early parts of the day tomorrow. Either way, it'll still look to be a Category 2 hurricane as it moves that way. It's going to start to encounter some cooler water thanks to what's le been left behind by Adalia and Franklin. Those waters are much cooler as it moves to the north, but that also means that as it moves to the north, we're going to see this system expand, and that means that the impacts will be farther reaching, right? So here's what we have right now. This is the latest track. It takes it Saturday morning, now Category 1. As we get into Sunday morning, we're talking a, a, a tropical storm, extra tropical probably, but for the purposes of, of what you need to know, we're talking impacts to folks in the New England area and potentially Atlantic Canada. That's where we're going to see likely the direct impacts. And it does look like we could see potential impacts for folks in places like Maine as far as landfall is considered. Remember where this cone is is where the center could come on shore. Now, the impacts will be far reaching from that. We'll still see some gusty conditions likely across parts of New England. Notice we have the red along the coast. That means that the high risk of rip currents, the coastal erosion, the high surf is all going to be on the table for folks up and down the coast. 
uh, really as far south as, as Florida, stretching all the way up into the northeast. If you live in the mid-Atlantic or points north, I really wouldn't recommend swimming as we get into this weekend. We'll see some really unsettled conditions out at the coast, but we'll also have the potential for, like I mentioned, uh, impacts as far as direct impacts are concerned. These are the spaghetti plot models. Notice where they're coming from. Southeasternly, it, it, uh, kind of landfall we would be talking for folks in Maine or, again, parts of uh, the Atlantic Canada region. Now, here's what we've seen so far in history. We don't have a whole lot of, of hurricanes to work with in this region. Places like the Atlantic Canada, yes, we've seen more, but there's been a handful of them in places like, um, like Maine. But one thing to note, not from the same trajectory that we're looking at for, uh, for what we're watching for Hurricane Lee. So that'd make a big difference when it comes to the impacts as far as storm surge, as far as winds. We'll be watching all of that, and we'll have the potential to see some really heavy rainfall, uh, upwards of one, two, maybe even three inches of rain on already saturated ground. So even if we don't have that strong of, of winds, we could still see some trees coming down from that. And of course, the flooding concern will be something that we'll watch for the next couple of days. Meanwhile, we've got the flooding concern for folks from the Midwest stretching down to uh, Texas. We've got some heavy rain working through. That's ahead of a cold front that's slowly but surely making its way across the country. It's going to leave folks in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic unsettled. And this is ahead of what we're watching for Lee as we get to Friday into Saturday into parts of the weekend. We're going to see a low risk of severe weather, so we're not going to worry too much about the tornadoes and such today, but we could see some gustier winds associated with this as we get into the day tomorrow, but we'll also see that heavy rain once again. So uh, you're going to need the umbrella and you're going to want to have it with you for really the extended period. Here's the rainfall amounts as we get into the middle of the week. So tomorrow you can see pretty impressive for parts of northern New England, one, maybe two inches of rain in some of the highest spots. So we'll watch for the soggy conditions to stay with us. But look what's behind that front. If you're looking for some cooler fall air, low 70s in Chicago, Detroit, nice conditions through the day today. We'll start to see that work a little farther to the east by tomorrow. Pittsburgh running below normal with a high of just 70 degrees. Buffalo into the mid 60s. We're starting to get into that kind of September feel here. Uh, and as we look ahead to Thursday, Friday and rolling into the weekend, mid 70s lasting for Washington, D.C., but we'll be back to the 80s by Saturday. Boston will linger into those mid 70s for the end of the work week and mm. into the 60s by the time we get into the weekend ahead, guys. Earlier this morning, we told our viewers swimming in open water is good for your mental health. Yeah. Angie just said, yeah, but don't do it right now. Yeah, not this weekend. <laughs> yes, but important right. safety reminder. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate <laughs> Thanks, it. Of course. Coming up on Morning News Now, a new COVID booster could be going into the arms of Americans by the end of this week. So what do you need to know about it as cases begin to rise again in some states? We've got our doctor on call later in the hour. But first, I'll bring you an NBC News exclusive, my one-on-one -on -one conversation with Lyft's CEO about a brand new feature that he thinks will put more women behind the wheel. Stay with us. Welcome back. This morning, entertainment giant MGM Resorts and Casinos is recovering from a cybersecurity incident. It disrupted services across the country late Sunday night and into Monday. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin has the details. A cybersecurity issue leaving visitors out of luck at MGM Resorts and Casinos on the Las Vegas Strip and beyond. I have to pay cash at a lot of the restaurants because the credit card machines are not working. On Monday, the entertainment giant released a statement saying it had identified a cybersecurity issue affecting some of the company's systems and took prompt action to protect our systems and data, including shutting down certain systems. Some of the slots are down, but not all of them. Guests and visitors taking to social media to report malfunctioning digital room keys, slot and gaming machines offline, resort ATM and withdrawal machines also down. This was a late night scene in the hotel lobby when guest Zach Schiffman attempted to check into a five star MGM property on the strip and discovered the systems were down. He finally made it to his room two hours later. They had to manually process everything. They couldn't run credit cards for incidentals, so they had to and write it all on a um, pre-filled form that would get manually processed. So it was essentially like you returned to the 90s. Basically. <laughs> Everyone was very frustrated in line. While it's unclear what this latest cybersecurity issue is about, experts say MGM's response seems to indicate an attack rather than another data breach. So if we think about the loss of data, that means someone's come in and taken our stuff and stolen it. That is very different than someone coming in and disrupting our day-to-day -day operations with malware or ransomware or something like that. So this is more of a disruptive event 
than a theft. Thanks to Aaron for that report. Late Monday evening, MGM responded to NBC News updating its previous statement, saying our casino gaming floors are operational. We continue to work diligently to resolve this issue. They did not specify exactly what the issue was, but they have made clear they've started an investigation and have notified law enforcement. Well, now let's get to an NBC News exclusive. Millions of people across the country, across the world, use rideshare services every day to get from point A to point B. And no, now Lyft is rolling out a new feature, Women Plus Connect. I spoke with Lyft's new CEO, David Richard, to learn all about this latest feature and why he thinks it will help get more women behind the wheel. This morning, rideshare app Lyft is rolling out a brand new feature, Women Plus Connect, in five cities from Chicago to San Diego, which will give women Lyft users the option to request a driver or passenger of the same gender. Maybe you're in a new city, maybe it's late at night, maybe you've had a couple drinks, whatever it might be, and just for your own peace of mind, the ability to choose a woman driver might be exactly the thing that allows you to say, you know what, yeah, this really is making my life better. If you're in one of the five cities where Women Plus Connect is launching, drivers and riders who have selected woman or non-binary as their gender can open the updated app and will be prompted with an option to enable the new feature. It's literally, you know, a toggle that you can always turn on or off. Just like Lyft that. CEO David Risher hopes to provide that feeling of comfort and safety, not just for the riders, but the drivers too. Lyft says just 23% of its drivers are women. Risher hopes to increase that number. Half the population, roughly, are women. But today, some segment of those women riders are saying, I don't always feel comfortable in your car. That's bad for us. We want the opposite. That comfort could be key given a persistent issue facing rideshare apps. Reports of sexual harassment and assault perpetrated by both riders and drivers. Competing service Uber reported over 3,800 incidents in 2019 and 2020, while Lyft said it had over 4,000 between 2017 and 2019. Is this an acknowledgement of that problem? Is this meant to help fix that, this new feature? I mean, I think it's an acknowledgement of the world we live in that sexual assaults happen. Unacceptable, terrible, even one is unacceptable. We have to create an environment where it's going to happen less and less and less and less. Single mom Mimi Fan has been driving for Lyft for over a decade. She says the feature makes her feel more comfortable requesting passengers at different times of day and in different areas. And for me as a female driver, I would feel just an extra layer of confidence where, you know, I can just really focus on, you know, the, the ride itself. Do you think this could make more women want to drive for Lyft if they know that they have that power about who's getting into their car? Absolutely. So Uber, of course, they're big competition. They offer a similar option, but just internationally, not here in the U.S. The majority of rideshare drivers are men, as we mentioned in that piece, and both companies say that their end goal is offering gig work in a way that makes women more comfortable behind the wheel. Think about that as a real revenue opportunity. It's an issue maybe a lot of people hadn't really thought about, or at least mm -hmm. men maybe hadn't thought about. Yeah, I think it really that's true. is important now to think yeah, about it more. Absolutely. In those five cities, San Diego, San Jose, San Francisco, Chicago, Phoenix, tomorrow you update your app, you can pick it right away. Very cool. Savannah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, coming up, a new COVID booster has just been given the green light by the FDA just in time for fall. That's right, and we could see shots in arms potentially by the end of the week. So what do you need to know about it as some states report a concerning rise in cases? Our doctor is in after this. Welcome back. Well, the FDA has given the all clear for a new COVID-19 booster shot. It sets the stage for a national rollout, just as cases across the country are on the rise. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has more. Vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer could go into arms by the end of the week. Drug makers say boosters should increase protective antibodies against the latest strains, including BA286. The CDC says the mutation shows the ability to infect the protected and even those who've already had COVID, but it doesn't appear to be more severe. What this booster will do is protect us against severe disease, hospitalization, and the data so far indicate that the booster is well matched to those strains. Though national COVID cases are no longer tracked, some states are reporting a rise, though not a worrisome wave, in new infections. Hospitalizations are up nearly 16 percent, even though 97 percent of adults have some level of protective immunity. I was extremely exhausted and just like bad congestion. 
College senior Lou Maestri just caught the virus as she returned to school, just like many adults have at work and at large venues. Last week, a lot of my classes were empty because a lot of kids were reporting that they were sick. While the federal government will no longer pay for booster shots, most Americans will be covered by private insurance or Medicare. Local clinics are also expected to offer the roughly $120 shot for free. While many new infections are mild, there is concern a winter wave could be near if Americans don't take precautions or get protection. All right, Miguel Almaguer, thanks so much. Now we're joined by NBC News medical contributor Dr. Kavita Patel. Dr. Patel, good morning. So as we just heard in Miguel's story, this strain doesn't appear to be as severe as some of the initial variants. Still, why is it important for people to get this latest shot? Yeah, Joe and Savannah, it's incredibly important because even though this strain is not as severe, overall COVID is still more deadly and results in more deaths and more hospitalizations than flu. And we talk about the flu shots all the time. So we have a vaccine. It is effective against the current circulating strains plural and probably the next strains that we'll see in another surge. And so it's a good idea to get it, especially the older you are. So, Dr. Kavita Patel, this is, I don't know why I just said your full name, Dr. Patel, um, this is a small detail that is maybe, I think, indicative of where we're headed with this. This is actually categorized as an annual immunization versus just a COVID booster. Walk us through that difference and if that kind of indicates for people what, what we're going to see soon. Yeah, I think it does hint the annual refers to we're seeing kind of hopefully a, a yearly pattern to these surges that we can expect in an updated vaccine on a yearly basis. But it also points to the fact that we're not boosting that original series. Remember, for years we've been talking about a booster because it really had to depend on you getting that original set of shots, no matter which shots you got, one, two or three shots, depending on your age. And now it's just a straight up one shot, one time, unless there are some differences if you're in the six month to kind of five year age range, but for the majority of the country, one shot and that's it, just like the other shots, like an annual flu shot. So Dr. Patel, we know flu season also right around the corner. So help us understand, can you get the flu shot and this updated COVID vaccine at the same time? How should you work out the timing for all your shots? You can. I, look, I'm a big believer that our time is our most precious commodity. So get everything <laughs> when you can get them and what's convenient for you. You can get both shots in one arm safely and they won't interfere with each other. I am telling most patients, though, that if you haven't had COVID recently and you know you're going to have some upcoming holiday travel, think about Halloween as a good milestone for everything flu shot that covid annual shot and that way you have that protection through those really kind of heavy travel and kind of holiday months when we all want to go out have some parties have interactions with friends so think about the timing for any of these shots all right dr kavita patel we'll mark our calendars do it by halloween thank you so yes, much appreciate thank you. it well coming up if you are always a bridesmaid and never a bride as they say then odds are you might be a little sick of how much money you're spending on all those costly custom festivities. And it's got some in the wedding party saying we don't. <laughs> We're talking bridesmaid <laughs> burnout. That's next on Morning News. We're back with some money news now. Get your wallets ready because TikTok shop is coming to the U.S. And people love this. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other financial headlines. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Yep, TikTok has finally launched its e-commerce product, TikTok Shop, in the U.S. after months of testing. The company is rolling out features such as a dedicated shop tab on the home screen, live video shopping, and shoppable ads. TikTok tells the New York Times it's already signed up more than 200,000 sellers and more than 100,000 creators already have the ability to make shoppable videos. TikTok says all user data is stored in the U.S. and managed by a separate unit. Separately, TikTok accidentally blocked videos about the Hollywood writer strike while it was trying to block uh, QAnon conspiracy theories on the platform. Post containing WGA didn't return any search results. There is a QAnon slogan, WWG1WGA. Terms like Writers Guild of America weren't affected. The search results have since been restored. And DraftKings is apologizing after referencing the 9-11 attacks in a sport bet. The company offered users a promotion titled Never Forget. It required three New York teams 
the Mets, Jets, and Yankees to win their games yesterday, the 22nd anniversary of the attacks on the World Trade Center. After an outcry on social media, DraftKings took the offer down. It won't say how many people placed bets or whether the bets remain valid or were canceled, guys. All right, Savannah, so, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, if you've been tapped to be a bridesmaid in a wedding, you know it can come with a lot of extra responsibilities, like helping to plan the bridal shower and the bachelorette party, and it can also come with some hefty expenses. According to Glamour, a 2017 study from Wedding Wire found bridesmaids spent between $1,200 to $1,800 to carry out their duties. And with inflation, Glamour says it's closer to $1,500 to $2,300 today. It is leading to what is called bridesmaid Burnout. Look at this cover. I love this. We don't. Well, Glamour is tackling it all in its latest issue. We don't. The Bridesmaid Burnout. Samantha Berry, editor and chief of Glamour, joins us on this. Now, Sam, it's Thank great you. to see you. You too. What a topic. I got married almost a year ago, actually. Next week is my anniversary. And, or in a couple days, actually. And I didn't have bridesmaids well, because, you know, it's like, it is it is a lot to ask. That means you're a considerate bride. <laughs> because, honestly, it has got next level. That's why I think we talked a lot, a lot about it at Glamour. And there's just this consensus you know there's women that work at glamour that are aged from 20 right up to 50 and it was just like we're done we're right done. right and it's, how can you can you ask like what is this going to cost me up front that seems awkward but if that's your concern honestly i think we, we talk about this in one of the stories where it's like how to be a considerate bride. Well, first of all, what's the scope of work, right? What's important to you? Is it important to you that you go with 35 of your best friends to Nashville and everybody wears pink? Is it important to you? <laughs> I don't know. Is it important to you that somebody stands up next to you on the day and their hair is a certain way, they wear a certain dress? I think understanding as a bride, what is the scope of work you're asking of these mm. women in your life? And then understanding as a person, you can say no. Mm. I know it's awkward. I know it's uncomfortable. We have a story from Jenny Singer about how to say no wow. to being a bridesmaid. That's my question. How do you yeah, do that without that like? ruining your relationship with the person? I think, first of all, you can say, look, and lots of people want to say no for a couple of reasons, right? They want to say no because they don't want the financial output, right? We're talking in the thousands there. These are yeah. young women. We're talking about two months' rent for some of the women mm -hmm. that we talk to. Mm -hmm. And you can say, what is expected of me? And... You can also say, I, I'm not in a financial position to have that. I love you. I want to support you. We've had um, and Rue on our team who wrote this amazing resignation letter. She wrote that while she wants to stand by her friends and be with them, she's over being a bridesmaid. I think you can also say yes to being a bridesmaid with conditions, right? <laughs> I can come uh, to your wedding. I will be there to organize a bridal shower, but I'm not going to make... The bachelorette mm. i think that's important it is this we've got to the stage where these um the expectations that are put on a bridal party are getting a little unwieldy we have mm -hmm. amazing confessions where some <laughs> bridesmaids end up naked others ended up having to feed the bride on the on the wedding day it's just it's just a bit <laughs> it's a mental toll uh, of it too <laughs> it is and it, even just one of the things brides can do to be considerate is you know have a how are you going to organize this because they talked about text message threads that were hundreds of messages trying to organize oh, one event. I've been in those. How are you going to organize it is important. Yeah. What about can, what about if you just don't like the dress? That's not a good enough reason. You know what? It, it, it's interesting because in Rue's resignation letter, she talked about her um, fashion independence is all something that's really important to her. But it, that kind of goes out the window right. when you're a sure. bridesmaid, right? Um, we've had we've heard stories from women that were kicked off bridal parties because they were trying to conceive. And the brides didn't feel that a pregnant bridesmaid oh. was was the look that they were going for. Well, in the dress. that might be a friendship okay. reevaluation oh, situation wow. in the dress. We do actually have um, a series of. Uh, if you do have to be a bridesmaid, here's some cute options and some affordable options. Again, um, looking at the cost. It's important to keep in mind. Tell us more about Rue's resignation letter. Well, she was when a bridesmaid three times. Three times. She's still right? early in her bridal career, I okay. suppose. Right? That's and, nothing. And, and, nothing. And so what nothing. did she, what did she do, and why is she coming to that conclusion? Well, she was, and again, she reiterates in her letter that she. Looked loves these people. Two of them are family and are her best friend. But um, there was a couple of occasions, including uh, that just kind of ended up 
for her. One was the, the, the dresses, and what happened with the dresses, the change of dresses, the financial uh, outlay of the dresses. There was also a bachelorette party in, I'm going to say Miami, where uh, fake Magic Mike tickets were bought, oh, and uh, everybody had to take the hit for that. But the, I think the final straw for her was um, there was a uh, condition on how she should wear her hair. And for Rue, as um, a black woman, and she writes a lot in Glamour about um, how she wants to wear her hair, I think that was the, the final straw that broke the camel's back for her. All right. Uh, so much to consider. <laughs> you don't even know. I yes. don't know. <laughs> but I hope the brides are open-minded and understand. I They're asking a lot of exactly. people. Yes. And maybe just, and you yes. know. If somebody says no to being a bridesmaid, yeah. that's okay. And to be okay. clear, I still boundaries. asked a lot. Yeah. I don't want to act like I was like a saint. Like, my wedding was international, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, there was no dresses, hair, bachelorette somewhere else. So, anyway. Yeah. All right. Samantha Berry, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Appreciate thank the conversation. Thank you. Great to see you. Coming up, we are in the final days of Fashion Week here in New York. After the break, we've got the inside scoop on all of this year's hottest looks and, of course, the celebrities that have been spotted. Stick around. It's up next. Welcome back. Well, a new record has just been set for the longest space mission by a U.S. astronaut. NASA's Frank Rubio has been on the International Space Station, get this, since last September. He's now broken the previous record of 355 days. And if he returns to Earth on the current schedule, he will have managed 371 days straight up in space. Rubio, who is a father of four, was actually only supposed to be in space for six months. But the spacecraft that would have taken him home turned out to be unsafe. So he had to wait months while a new one was prepared. Well, congratulating him on the feat, NASA's boss, Bill Neeson, said his mission embodies the essence of exploration, adding, your dedication is truly out of this world. Frank, I bet he misses those I'm four sure kids. <laughs> He's like, we need to extend the babysitter a little longer. Yeah, six months, and uh, it's going <laughs> to be a year. It's just, you know, it's just so far away. <laughs> well, have actually some more cool NASA stuff we'll bring you next week. Well, it's New York Fashion Week, and the city is showing up in style. Some of the biggest names in fashion have taken over, giving us a preview of the trends and looks for the upcoming season. Before it all wraps up, Tomorrow, we're taking a look at all the highlights so far from this year. Women's Wear Daily style director Alex Padilla joined us now with the inside scoop. So I guess one of the big headlines this week was Ralph Lauren making mm -hmm. a return. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that so and just cool. any other highlights you've seen from this week so far. Well, celebrities are everywhere. It's always fun for me because I get to talk to them. But um, <laughs> obviously, but also, I mean, I do think that it's kind of interesting what's happening with fashion right now. Before runway shows was about the collection, the clothes. Now it's also about reaching millions of people. Mm. It's like a TV show. It's great. And what was the Ralph Lauren event like? You know, it was like um, Jennifer Lopez in the front row, Christy Charlington closing the show. Oh. It's kind of amazing, right? Yeah. It shows you where we are. And the clothes are amazing. I love Ralph Lauren. He's such an icon of fashion and American fashion. He's changed the world for fashion for mm. sure. Absolutely. All right, so celebs, you just told us about some of them, but you said you get to talk to them. Give us the inside scoop. Who have you seen? What have you heard? Well, Janet Jackson was really friendly. Oh! <laughs> and really fun. Love that. Yeah. I know, great. Listen, I was talking to Ashley Graham yesterday oh. backstage at Michael oh, Kors. Awesome. She was giving great quotes about body inclusivity. Mm. is a big deal here in America. New York Fashion Week is the capital of body mm. inclusivity. We're still not there, but we're getting very, we're doing something good. For yeah. sure. In addition to body inclusivity, what are some of the trends that you're just seeing this year? Well, <laughs> red is the new pink. Oh. Um, TikTokers really announced this a few weeks ago. So designers are following really quickly. So we see red everywhere. Red is a good color. You know, it's all you need is passion, is danger, is attention. <laughs> Are we going to have to wear red on Wednesdays now? Is I, that what? <laughs> every Wednesday I wear pink, so that'll see. see well, that. red is next then. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Red's we, actually my favorite color, so that works out. It's great. But we see a lot of celebration of 90s fashion, a lot of sleep Ooh. dressing, a lot of minimalism. I mean, there is also something that seems maybe kind of ridiculous, but a lot of designers are doing wearable clothes. You know? <laughs> what a concept. Whoa. What a concept. I know, I mean, fashion people, we tend to complicate things a little bit. But no, yeah, there is a lot of minimalism, 90s, beautiful, quiet luxury. It's a big word right now. But yeah, it's a, it's a good time. Yeah, I'm no expert, but I do feel like just photos and videos that I've seen from this year, I'm like, oh, I feel like I could wear that. It's not something so unattainable or kind of like, you know, just for something special. Yeah, but American ready-to-wear is basically that, it's yeah. sportswear. It's yeah. wearable clothes. And when you see Prada doing a gray sweater, right. everyone is like, oh my God. And we're like, what? We've been doing this all along. Right, you know? right. <laughs> <laughs> you also just said something really interesting that the designers are seeing what TikTokers yeah. did. 
Is oh. that like a, a major trend now that you're seeing that like these people on social media are actually influencing major fashion houses? Well, obviously, because before it was the street, but now the street is social media. Right. So there is that dialogue huh. happening, you know? It's very yeah. interesting. You wonder, are they designing for TikTok and Instagram or are they designing for people? Okay, I feel you know? so much cooler with you being here now. Do but... the trends change faster because of that right Absolute now? Oh my God, you're getting it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. There you go. <laughs> they are changing so fast. Yeah. And before you would say, oh, that was Y2K. Now Y2K is in and out. Mm -hmm. And mini skirt mm. is like in and out. And now it goes like it's a maxi skirt. So it really changes really fast. What about sustainability? That's pretty important now, too, on a lot of these runways. Right? Yes. I mean, there is a lot of recycled leather. People are using uh, recycled fabrics or scraps to create. That's why there is a lot of patchwork right now. So all those things are really, people are really paying attention. That's the good thing, transparency, it, mm. uh, keeping people like, accountable. And, and I think these great. brands know that consumers, that's the way people are shopping now. Is the brand sustainable? When I started, we didn't really know anything. But now yeah. the consumer knows so much. It keeps you on your toes as a journalist so as well you red know? is the new pink all right there we go oh, just tomorrow yeah you <laughs> heard it red. here first all right alex media thank you so much fun conversation enjoy the next couple days yes happy fashion week let's get it for this hour of morning news now but the news continues right now don't go anywhere thanks for watching stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the nbc news app or follow us on social media